Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are y'all? Hi, so we are doing this live in person. We are also live streaming this too, so that's what the uh, cameras are for. So this is being live streamed currently on uh, Instagram and on Facebook. So hello, you watching in Facebook and Instagram world. <laughs> um, Especially the people who got up and came down here today. 100%, yeah. Um, uh, for being here in person too, you'll get a 10% coupon to use today in store. So any of the things that we're talking about that piques your interest, yeah, you get 10% off of them. So that's kind of nice. So, and it's all really nice to see your faces. It's really, really fun. My name is Sarah Smith and this is Suzanne Hetrick. Hello, good morning, good morning. I'm Tuesday, she's Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> if you watch the, the live streams, then you know. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, but we've started uh, opening up again, so we're doing these live in person, which is really, really nice. I love personally being able to see your faces and being able to, inter it's Absolutely. fun to interact on the live streams because you ask your questions and all that, but it's nice to see the faces too. I think we both really appreciate that. On this blisteringly hot August Morning. Yeah, we were going to talk about how hot it is, and it's kind of weirdly <laughs> cold today. <laughs> yeah, definitely taking a turn for the cooler. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so this is the uh, monthly checklist of what to do in your garden this month. Uh, so we're going to go over all the different things. If we don't touch on something that you have questions on, at the end we'll ask uh, answer all your questions for you. Uh, same thing with all of you on uh, Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, you can always put your questions down below. Uh, we'll currently have someone answering them as we go, but we'll also maybe ask a couple questions at the end too. Uh, and then if you um, want to watch this later, you'll be able to go on because we'll post this on Instagram and on Facebook as well. So what to do in your garden in August. So typically, <laughs> except for this morning, it's really, really hot. Uh, so uh, August is a funny month in the garden. It's like... It is. It's kind of a... It's, it's almost like coming out of July, it's enjoy your garden, yeah. look at your garden, and then contemplate, is there is there ever a bad time to think about your Halloween and Thanksgiving gardening? <laughs> yeah. No, but think think a little bit ahead, mm -hmm. and um, for the things that you might want to try, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a little bit more limited, but no less... Um, yeah gratifying. yeah in the gardening world we say if you're not completely overwhelmed with your garden right now then you didn't plant enough so yeah. plant more but i know i'm completely overwhelmed in my garden right now because i my eyes are bigger than my yard so i buy way too much stuff um but yeah this is this is a time to just kind of battle the heat uh work on your watering uh make sure that you're kicking up your watering to stay on top of it a little bit more i know i'm really guilty at kind of setting a schedule and not changing it and realizing oh it's july and august i need to start watering a little bit more uh, making sure you're really paying extra attention to your pots um I'm really guilty of that and I was kind of noticing some of my pots are real sad because I haven't been watering them more. Um, whenever you're watering, the big thing you want to do is work on watering long, low, and slow. Uh, so just making sure that you're not watering shallowly every single day, um, which is also kind of hard to do, but um, watering long and low and slow to just kind of keep the soil down low wet but to keep the soil on the top kind of dry and maybe, maybe just paying mm -hmm. super close attention to trees people think yes. oh this tree has been here 10 20 30 40 years um at this time of the year this is when you really need to give them a little extra love because that little extra bit of water or i should say a big dump of water mm -hmm. like once a week just a nice just set the hose to trickle and walk away and let that tree just totally hydrate itself it's gonna really make a big big difference and especially if if you have birches and things like that they are riparian trees they grow near rivers and they really need the water so yeah pay, pay extra attention to your big plants and the other thing too we and we talked about this last month but um if you haven't already mulch that really helps too. Um, mulching your garden, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, it keeps uh, you know your soil cool when it needs to be cool, but warm when it needs to be warm. It, you know, it's insulation, which is really kind of amazing. Um, and that weed will, suppression. yeah, weed suppression. And it, it's pretty, it looks so much nicer than just looking at your dirt, right? So it's, it's a really um, nice thing to do right now and get that mulch in the ground now and on top of everything. Um, really really helps with the garden as well so we want to talk about annuals yes yeah okay so annuals we have um i don't have a lot of annuals on my cart here but 
Annuals, is one of the things that you can plant right now to give you some zhuzh in your garden are some annuals, some perennials as well, but things like marigolds are really gonna, you know, take the heat and be okay as long as you keep them well watered. Petunias, again, you know, you want to start thinking about Halloween or, you know. <laughs> I think this is such a great combination. These, these really, really pretty um, kind of antique yellow petunias. And these are um, perennial petunias here, but we'd have the annuals up there. This is more of an annual and it's super pretty. It's called Starry Night. I think so. There are a couple of different names with those. There's also yeah. a black one too sometimes yeah, that we get. One yeah, speckles. They're really fun to kind of put Galaxy. in pots and let them sort of pop out yeah. and see things. Um, so we also have, and this this is like a tender perennial, we have the um, pentas. These are really, really beautiful. They're also called star flowers. They come in a million colors, and the great thing about these is that hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees love them, so it's perfect for a pollinator garden if you want to um, get some more, uh, you know, beautiful action going on in there. And this one, is, I'm sorry, I keep going back to the Halloween garden. I know, but that one's so, so pretty. <laughs> this is a, uh, it's filled with ants. Um, this is a uh, kufia, and it's called bat face kufia. And if you can sort of see the flowers, they do look a little bat face if you get up close to them. So they're a really fun flower to put in there for um, Halloween. And let's see what else. Um, little fun plants, kind of perennial, kind of tender perennials, are these um, gylardias. And these are called blanket flowers. My favorite color of Gylardia is this kind of lemony yellow, but a lot of people really love the super red ones. And these things are going to bloom all through fall. They're just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. And then, of course, Rubecchia. Rubecchia. These are just beautiful, kind of fall time perennials. Isn't it interesting that we all like these colors at fall, but that's kind of what blooms at this this time are these brown and these gold and these orange flowers that are so beautiful and look you could match it with some lantanas there. I feel like if you want to have a, a pollinator garden right now and you're just starting, um, there's plenty of things to still plant that are going to be beautiful for fall like the lantana and these gylardia, the rudbeckias. All of them have that fall color that you can kind of pull through for a couple of months there. Yeah. It's nice because we don't get a lot of fall change here either, so it's nice to kind of add that into the gardens and into yeah. your pots by your front door because we don't get a lot We're of. Gonna insist that it's fall with yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're gonna convince ourselves. Yes, and I, I love I love putting fall color in. It's yeah, just, it's one of the few times that I actually add little bits of color. Yeah, absolutely, and just keeping those things fertilized and well watered when you're getting them in the ground because it's hot so we yes. just got to make sure that we're being careful about our watering to get them established like twice a week mm -hmm. twice a week yeah. maybe if you live further inland more than like a mile or two inland maybe three times a week just a good slow deep soaking mm -hmm. yeah um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, fruiting plants. So I'm completely obsessed with strawberries and blueberries, like everything berry. Yes. Um, I am. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's a lot of really nice things right now. If you don't already have them in your garden, you can still get them established in your garden. If you if got them in already, they're going crazy right now. I just kind of wrapped up my blueberry uh, harvest, but I'm still getting trickles and, and dribbles uh, hey, there. Check out the strawberries at our first customer yes. service They've been planted for six or eight months, mm -hmm. and um, they're just still going crazy. Every single day, yeah, lots of yeah. So we all walk in first thing in the morning and pick the strawberries and eat them. <laughs> so yeah. that's our morning ritual. But um, uh, blueberries, we have a really good selection of blueberries right now. I grabbed my two personal favorites and we have them, uh, which is really exciting. Um, uh, this one here is a sunshine blue. Uh, my sunshine blue is a little bit taller than my bountiful blueberry. They say you need to have two blueberries to get uh, blueberries from your plant. That's actually not true. But if you do have more 
than one, you tend to get about maybe 15, 20% more on all of your plants. Um, so I, I love both of these ones. Varieties. Yeah, two different varieties, I should say. Um, they do great in pots. I do all my blueberries in pots. Um, it's nice because they want a little bit of acidity, but the varieties we carry don't demand a ton of it. So yeah, this acid mix here is fantastic. You can mix, uh, in a pot, you can mm -hmm. do half and half with potting soil and the acid planting mix, yeah. and that really helps you control the acid. Yeah. They're much happier. We have uh, an acid fertilizer too um, that we sell. I actually alternate between this one and the all purpose, and then I throw coffee grounds occasionally on to my plants don't overdo it i did it one year where i overdid it and i thought my blueberry is a weird orange color and i thought what is wrong with that so i googled it and sure enough i over acidified it uh, so they don't require a ton uh, but keeping them in pots i find uh keeps them happier because they can keep the soil acidified i've grown them in the ground and they just never seem to do as well in the ground for me as they do in pots which is fine by me uh that means i can have more blueberries basically so um but it's really really fun um the bountiful blue really is really prolific um it's kind of great uh and and the size is so great in both these two but we have a lot of variety o'neill is over there as well um there's a new one bountiful something there's another bountiful one right now i for abundant a bountiful of boundance so okay <laughs> Also with blueberries is if you have any space in your garden in between other plants, mm -hmm. you can throw a blueberry in there as a little shrub. And yeah. it's gonna just be really cute mm -hmm. and gorgeous. And they are cute. some space and give you blueberries. Yeah, they're they're really, really fun. My other thing that I'm, I'm completely obsessed with is strawberries. Uh, I've she's, been she's made me become yeah, I think I've kind of turned everybody on to this particular strawberry. Strawberries in general are super easy to grow as well. Uh, I find they grow really well also in containers. Uh, strawberries appreciate a little bit of acidity too, so I have some of my blueberry pots with an underplanting of strawberry um, there as well. But every single pot that I have, there's a strawberry tucked in there somewhere because uh, strawberries, your traditional strawberries, what you're more used to seeing is a strawberry like this. You see this big long piece coming out here. This is a runner. So this is actually going to produce a little baby plant on the end with some roots on it. Um, with these, um, you can put them into the ground and let them root and make a new little baby. Um, around this time of year, however, I keep them cut off um, if I'm still looking at getting production on my strawberries. Um, once these start running and they start producing little babies on the end, I tend to get not get as many strawberries on my plant, so I pinch these off. However, if I have a weird variety, because I collect all kinds of weird strawberry varieties and I only have one or two, Right now I'm letting them make the little babies because I want more of them because uh, I only have one or two of some stranger varieties. They're but kind of like succulents in that mm -hmm. once you buy one, you can eventually have a ton, ton of them. Yeah. Just yeah. And then I gift them, them to people too. I'll, I'll run these out into like a little additional pot somewhere and then I'll just cut them and I give them away to people. Um, but if you want to keep your strawberry production going, cut these off. Uh, that's That'll really help because they definitely will slow down if you don't just keep these. The Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, how this is my favorite, favorite one right here. So this is, I got introduced to an Alpine strawberry at a seminar just like this when I was probably about 20 years old. Um, and this is, and here I am, you know, a lot oh, yeah. of years later. <laughs> um, this is an Alpine strawberry. Um, Alpine strawberries are like wild strawberries. These don't produce runners. However, I do get a lot of little babies around my plants um, that I have planted. It's a great border plant because of the fact that it doesn't produce the runners and get too out of control. I find these straight in the ground kind of take up a whole area. These as a border plant is really, really great. Um, they're really pretty. Um, I love planting them with like alyssum in between because that strawberry and a white flower together is just such a classic combo. Um, these are tiny little berries. They're kind of like wild strawberries. Um, this particular one is my favorite one. Uh, this is called, they call it yellow wonder. Yeah, it's yellow wonder. It's funny, it's not yellow, it's white. <laughs> it's a white strawberry. Uh, I'm not sure why they call it yellow. Um, I love the red ones, but the white ones I think are tastier. They're um, a they're little amazing. bigger. Yeah, they're less seedy. Cause they tend to, you know, they're like wild strawberries. So they're a little bit on the seedy side, but not too bad. Um, the flavor is 
They're almost I, like I a mean, grape or something. If I say perfumey, yeah. But that's gonna make you think. Ugh. But it's actually just it's like a little bite of. They're heaven. fantastic. They're, They're fantastic, and it's so fun too because this is not something you can get at most nurseries. You know, I've I've gone tons of nursery hopping, and you very rarely see anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't find the fruit in stores. No one's gonna sell the Alpine strawberries. They're too small, they're too um, complicated to pick to get a lot, and they're very, very delicate. So they don't ship well. Um, they don't particularly store well. But what I love about this, I make little tiny berry bundles in my hand while I'm gardening. So it's like blueberries and little Alpine strawberries and a couple of big strawberries. Um, especially if you're gonna have a party and you have friends over and you're entertaining, um, making like a cute little parfait with a mix of, especially the white and red strawberries on there looks so beautiful and so different, so unique, and it's so impressive. So anytime I have anybody over, I'm constantly going, here, try this. And I'm putting berries in their hands and they're just like, what? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, strawberries. yeah, and then, and then I've just, it's, Amazing. they're so fun, they're so great. Um, I, they're such a great surprise because you don't really see them until suddenly they're there. I know, and they're so cute, the they're white cool. ones are so beautiful, they're so they are, unique and, and different. Put so many in your hands, it's mm -hmm. so nice. Yeah, so now I think just about everybody here is, I've forced these on everybody at some point, so I think everybody's got some of these here. But Alpine strawberries, so great. Love the red, love the yellow wonder. It's not truly yellow, it's it's more of a white color. We have a visitor today. Um, but yeah, they're just, they're absolutely, and they border so well. So all my veggie gardens are bordered in Alpine strawberries. So it's just fun too, because as I'm gardening, I'm eating. <laughs> and it's just such a lovely, lovely little thing to have, and they're so pretty. They are so Yeah, absolutely yeah. obsessed with those. Okay, yeah. so what do we got I'm next? I'm going to talk about roses and geraniums at yes. this time. Um, it's hot. Roses are maybe blooming a lot, but a lot of them are kind of getting ready for their next big push. And so the push is usually October y. Yes. So right now you're going to be deadheading like mm -hmm. crazy. Roses and geraniums. Deadhead everything. The more you deadhead, the better they bloom again. And also, don't forget to fertilize. This is a once a month fertilizer. It's so easy. And I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised when people come and they buy five roses or something and they, and they say, I need some fertilizer. And I hand them this and they say, oh, it's so much. It's so much. But it's really not. This is organic fertilizer. It is amazing. You're going to put maybe like a half to three quarters of a cup per plant per month. So it's not really that much and it's so easy because if you don't want to measure, just do it by handfuls, you know, one, two, three handfuls around each rose. It'll slowly percolate in as you're watering and it's it's a really nice slow release. It's not going to push the rose too much. It's just going to be this steady diet of really good food. So that's super important. At this time of year, rose slugs seem to be um, just rampant. Uh, they are they're the little things that make your rose leaves look like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. And it's it's funny, when you work in a, a gardening store like this, a nursery, um, you can almost tell when someone says, my rose, and you will say, oh, it's July or August, your rose legs. We don't even have to look. <laughs> yeah. We're pretty sure it's rose yeah. legs, or maybe rest. But um, this is a great spray. Um, any kind of spray with uh, spinosad in it is going to work well. This is the Monterey Insect Spray ready to use. And um, you're going to spray that just basically on the top of the leaves. You don't have to really get it too bad only because those little worms are going to eat their way through. And so they're going to, they're going to get this yeah. one way or the other. The rose slugs are a soft fly larva, so they're, they're not like a BT kind of, I don't know if you have BT here. I do. But, um, they're not what you're going to use BT on. This is a very specific thing. It looks like a worm, but it's actually a, um, a little larva. Yeah, yeah. So just use your uh, spinosad-based products. Use them late in the day. They are not great for bees, and so you want to make sure the bees have gone home. Spray your plants, and then it'll dry on the plant. And hopefully the next day, it'll be great. Oh, rose and flower. This is a great product as well. It's a three-in-one. So it's a, um, a pesticide. Wait, hold on. It kills insects, mites, and controls fungus. I think we might be past the whole um, 
powdery mildew. Yeah, I have maybe. a little bit Although still. this morning probably mm -hmm. made me a liar on that one. But hopefully <laughs> at this point we're over powdery mildew mm -hmm. and we've got it in check. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times if you do have the powdery mildew, at this point, if you know it's going to be warm, just hose your plants down in the morning yeah. and the sun will actually kind of burn it off with the, mm -hmm. the weather. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the geranium, next, yeah. I mean, geraniums, just prune them back, fertilize mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And if they have bugs, uh, little worms, sorry, mm -hmm. then you would use Bt. Yeah, this works really well with, or this one works really well in those uh, little they get into the buds of the geraniums and eat around mm -hmm. uh, so this one works great on that um, with uh, all your acid loving stuff so drain or um, sorry azaleas camellias and hydrangeas um, this is kind of your last month to fertilize those you want to start fertilizing your camellias after they bloom and you stop around August time um, so I think a lot of it that seems so counterintuitive. You think they're flowering, I need to fertilize them, but they're actually dormant when they're flowering, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so you want to finish that up. They're very shallow rooted, uh, so they really appreciate the fertilize or the um, mulching um, as well. Uh, don't cultivate too hard underneath them because they are so shallow rooted, but the mulching, if you don't mulch underneath your your camellias, and, you'll notice a difference when you do it. And one of the things um, with mulch, there's so many, there's so many different things you can mulch with. So you can mm -hmm. use bark, you can mm -hmm. use shredded redwood or cedar, but you can also use soil yep. as a mulch. Mm -hmm. And so if you have your acid loving plants, yeah. feel free to use acid planting mix. Just put it on top of the soil around it, make sure you're not touching the stem of it. And then that will slowly work its way into the soil again helping it keep a little bit more acidified but it also keeps those roots cool and feeds the plants a bit yeah don't um trim your camellias right now this is the worst time to trim them if you start trimming them now you're not going to get any flowers you're going to cut off all the flowers yeah they work uh, hard all year to yeah. make those flowers mm -hmm. so yeah. no trimming on those right now um with your hydrangeas you can trim off all the old flowers your hydrangeas are going to start kind of slowing down um sometimes you can even let them kind of sit on the plant they almost dry kind of in a really pretty way certain varieties dry better and, and prettier than others um, but you can trim those down you'll see all on your hydrangeas that you'll have your stock with the flower and you'll have new stocks don't cut the new stocks only cut down the stocks that have the flowers on it if you cut those new stocks again what's going to happen is you're not going to have any flowers we have yes, so yes. yeah we have so many people come in and go I have no flowers well, on my hydrangea this year. Kinds of hydrangeas yeah. and you want to prune them differently mm -hmm. depending but for most of them those big yeah. top heads mm -hmm. yes. yeah and then and when I when I they tell me that I always say did your gardener cut it back last year and they go uh-huh and I think there you go you cut it at yes. the wrong time of year uh, so you want to be really really careful about that um, they do appreciate the acid uh, fertilizing um, same thing with your um, your gardenias your acid fertilizing with your gardenias um, they do need extra iron sometimes I find the grafted varieties are really amazing so if you don't have uh, any gardenias yet and you're looking to get a gardenia, yeah. splurge on a grafted one. Um, what happens with gardenias is when the soil gets too cold, uh, the fertilizer and the iron and stuff is not available and they just kind of like, it stays stunted in the ground and they can't pull it up. And those varieties are the ones that tend to get really super yellow. Uh, the grafted varieties don't have that problem. They use a root stock that is more able to pull up nutrients during the cold months. So it's, uh, it's really great. So it's a little bit more, I, but I, it's super yeah, worth I, it. I think it's almost, well, for most of our gardenias, mm -hmm. it's almost all of them come in grafted now. Yeah, pretty much, but yeah. It's also just like, gardenias are funny in the sense that whenever they're unhappy, they're going to turn yellow, whether it's mm -hmm. overwatering, mm -hmm. underfeeding, or, you know, just general displeasure with life. They're, <laughs> they're just so They're funny, drama queens. But they are. But I, if, they're just like fuchsias in the sense of moist feet, warm tops. A mm -hmm. lot of people think gardenias don't like sun. They do. They yeah, like they sun do. just fine. Mm -hmm. Just keep them consistently moist mm -hmm. and keep them fed. Fertilizer and, you know, moist feet, warm mm -hmm. tops and 
fertilizer. And cold at night, too. They yeah. don't like to be in, like, a lot of people tend to, like, I have a little alcove, and it's very protected, and I'm going to put my gardenia in there. What happens is it stays very warm at nighttime. And they also don't, they're so picky, so they don't like that either. So yeah. they do like to be in kind of open spaces where it can yeah. get a little bit cooler at nighttime. Um, so. I, I call them everybody else plants. Everybody else has really beautiful gardenias. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But they're, they're actually so much easier. Uh, I think a lot of people have shied away because we've grown yeah, up yeah. with the, yeah. yeah, the non-grafted ones that were just so drama-y about every single little thing. And those grafted ones are so much easier. So yeah. it's kind of nice to have a gardenia where you're like, wow, it looks great. And I'm not doing as much as I used to have to do with it all the time. So it's really nice. And, and gardenias only bloom when it's really warm. Yeah. So if you have a gardenia plant and it looks beautiful and you're like, why isn't it blooming? Put it in a warmer spot. Mm -hmm. It's yep. you know, sometimes up by your front mm -hmm. door. It's mm -hmm. just not getting... Yeah. It's too sheltered in the daytime yes. and too warm at nighttime. Yeah. They want the opposite of that. Yeah. Warm in the daytime, cold at nighttime. Yeah. Thank you for coming to our gardenia talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next, you want to switch spots with me? Avocados right. and citrus? Uh, no, I got, I got you that's you. Oh, it's me. I can oh. do it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> avocados and citrus. I love um, both of these plants. Uh, avocados and citrus. So citrus, as you all know, is having a hard time with the um, the greening disease. And then we also have problems with leaf miner. So um, if you can find citrus, like you can here at Rogers Gardens, which you can't at a lot of other places, we are not within a quarantine zone right now. Yeah. Um, right here along the coast, we can sell the, the citrus. And so we have Meyer lemons, I think we have Eureka lemons, we mm -hmm. have some kumquats, which we have not had for about a solid year. Kumquats. So if you love yes. kumquats, and who doesn't, kumquats are available right now. Get a gorgeous we, little kumquat. Um, we have some limes, we have bear's lime, uh, Mexican or key limes, mm -hmm. but it's um, citrus is easy to grow. Yes. Um, there's, uh, it's almost like they're opposite. So avocados are high water. They like to just be deeply watered twice a week and citrus are low water plants. So you wanna water them regularly so that your fruit is really nice and um, plump but not bursting or anything. Citrus, I'd say once a week and then in the cooler months, every other week or maybe even a little bit less, every three weeks, just a good deep soaking. But uh, citrus, they really need to be fertilized. Um, a lot of times, uh, this question just came up the other day, so I'm gonna like veer off just mm -hmm. a little bit on citrus. People will say, oh, I have this uh, this tree, and because my neighbor has a different kind of citrus tree, they're cross-pollinating and they taste really bitter and everything. That's not what happens with citrus trees. And usually, if you have a lot of, like an entire tree of bitterness from a tr uh, house maybe you just bought, oh, this tree is terrible, um, what happens is citrus is grafted, like down here. You can see this is the grafting rootstock. It's usually a bitter orange. You see where I'm going with this? And up here is the, oh, it's a kumquat. Yep. Um, so the kumquat uh, rootstock, uh, sorry, the kumquat graft is up here. So sometimes your graft somehow just takes over the plant. Maybe you get a little sucker and it goes out here and suddenly you're you're pruning it, you're cultivating it, and suddenly this plant goes away and this rootstock uh, sucker just kind of takes over. That's what happens. That's mm -hmm. why you have a lot of super bitter oranges. You could make some marmalade if you like. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. um, the thing is, is that uh, they don't cross-pollinate each other. They don't make each other taste weird. So just keep an eye on where your uh, tree is growing from and you'll be fine. It rarely happens that much anymore, but sometimes it can. So um, fertilize, fertilize. Avocado trees, um, this is an, actually one of the few, few plants that you should plant during a warmer weather time. Mm -hmm. It might be getting a little bit too warm, but you can still plant an avocado now, I think. Um, they are a tropical plant. They need to have their roots kept cool. So just like in a jungly area, they're going to have a lot of organic, um, uh, what do you say, organic matter, litter, mm -hmm. tree litter on mm -hmm. top of their roots, keeping them nice and cool. 
and um, the tops are going to be nice and warm, but they're usually sheltered underneath another tree. Avocado trees can burn very easily. Um, the leaves can burn, the stems can burn, and the fruit can burn. So that's why when you see avocado trees, they're almost pruned like an umbrella. So the outside can get a lot of sun, and inside all the fruit is going to be a little bit protected from the from the sun, but sometimes you'll see a little burnt avocado. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when avocado leaves drop, as they, they're really going to be doing a lot at this time for a while, let the leaves stay there. They are the perfect mulch for an avocado tree. Yep. And since you need to keep those roots cool, you can put mulch around it, but if you have leaves fall on top of it, leave it there. It's perfect. You just want to keep those roots super, super cool and water deeply probably once or twice a week right now, once a week in the cooler months. And yeah. you will have yourself some beautiful avocados. Free mulch. I two avocados. Um, yeah. Recently, and I'm super excited. I'm excited because I know I'll get some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Please stick with avocados. So. Yeah, that one's the uh, holiday too, oh, so it's the smaller one. Yeah, so it's a, a smaller tree, a little bit more compact, and mm -hmm. the fruit is, as I say, personal breakfast size. Yeah. They're really, really <laughs> nice. And they're such, they're just such a great, a great, beautiful addition. They can eventually become a big tree. But you can also keep them smaller. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to try and keep ours about 10 to 12 feet, but it's going to require a lot of discipline. Yes. On our part and on our trees' parts, but we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, I also brought the regular fertilizer for the citrus. You can also use this for the avocado. If you read the back of this, it says to do it three different times a year. Your next fertilizing. Um, would be in September. Um, however, if you're doing um, citrus in pots, do more than this. Um, I find that that's just not enough for my ones in the containers because as you're watering, stuff is getting flushed out the bottoms and the roots okay. can't go out the bottom of the pot. So now all your fertilizer is no longer available to the plant anymore. Um, so do uh, supplemental feeding in your containers. Um, I started using this. So I have two kumquats um, by the front of my door. They're so beautiful. They were so prolific last year. This year they just struggled. I think part of the problem was I wasn't doing the additional fertilizing. Um, I was a little bad about watering when it was getting hotter. Uh, they're in black pots, so it got particularly hot and they kind of fried. And I got worried because you couldn't get uh, kumquats. So I was thinking, oh man, I just killed the two I have and I can't get it anymore. Uh, I was really worried. However, with a lot of discipline, I really got uh, diligent about my watering. I got better about my fertilizing. I also started using this. I had never used this before. This is trace uh, fertilizer. So you wouldn't use this instead of this, but you can use this in addition to, and especially for a tree that's really going yellow and is struggling. Um, I put this down on the ground underneath my kumquats and they're looking great. So I'm super happy. I was getting worried about them. Um, this one you can mix with water and use it as a foliar um, as well. Um, you can also just put it on the ground. Um, my word of warning on this one is if you're going to put it straight on the ground, it says to put it down dry. Um, I put it down on top of just like all the citrus we sell, I have under plantings underneath my citrus and I had some really beautiful uh, oregano growing in one of my pots and it was looking perfect and I put this down and it got all over the oregano leaves and I looked at it and thought that seems not right to me. My intuition was telling me something was wrong. I watered it in, I washed the oregano leaves off the best I thought I could next day burnt it so bad so if you have an under planting underneath whatever you're putting this on uh, still mix it with water uh, water it in and then rinse off those leaves so you don't burn your plants like I did I did it right before I had some friends come over and I was so sad because it looked so it's bad it's just <laughs> right it popped back it looks great now but yeah you don't have Exactly. I took the fall for y'all. So uh, don't get this on any foliage. If you've got an underplanting of strawberries, just make sure you water it in instead and then rinse those strawberry leaves off because it doesn't like that. Well, just real quickly about citrus, since a lot of people are trying to grow it. Um, citrus loves being in a container. Yeah. There is no problem with growing a citrus in a container. There is dwarf citrus or semi-dwarf, what mm -hmm. we sell, and standard. Um, really the only difference is that a standard is like a lollipop, mm -hmm. so it's a stem and a big round thing, which you can also grow in a pot and keep it small, even though eventually it could get a lot bigger in the ground. 
and the semi-dwarf are just fine as well. Lemons and limes are a little bit funnier about being transplanted. So like you can put an orange in a pot and it's just going to take off. Sometimes lemons will be just jerks and they'll, <laughs> they'll lose all their leaves and they'll just look yeah. poorly. But just stay the course, don't overwater it, just they've got to get their roots settled and they don't mind being a little bit root bound. But um, they, they'll be flowering and you'll have like two leaves on the plants. Um, it's fine. It'll, it'll come back, I promise. <laughs> That's exactly what my lemon is doing. Yeah, it's just, sometimes lemons and lights can be just weird. Mine but looks great now, happy, but... Once they're settled yes. in that pot, there's no turning back. Yeah, when it's, I first planted mine, I thought, oh, I killed it. <laughs> and then it came back, and it looks great. <laughs> I, know, I was ordered to take our lemon out of our garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She was talking about leaf miner, too. That is something that you see a lot. It's that curled leaf on the, e the end of the new growth. Um, and when you really look at it, you can look at almost like into the leaf and you can see a little swirly. So that's- Almost like snail trail. Yeah, but it's inside the leaf. Um, that's the leaf miner. The spinosad works really great on that. Uh, that's this one, it, yeah. It is, I mm -hmm. do, but I don't even use it, to be honest. I it, pick a lot of it off, yeah. I, I just pull it off mm -hmm. and usually by the time that you see it, because the leaf miner is a little moth that lays its egg on the brand, brand, brand new uh, foliage on a citrus. And by the time you kind of see the damage, it's done. Mm -hmm. And so just cut it off. It doesn't mm -hmm. hurt the tree. It doesn't hurt the fruit. It just makes it look a little weird. So I'm just like, less, less pesticide um, is good for me. But if it's really, really bad, definitely use a spinosad. But late in the, late in the day, in yeah. the minutes, wow. True, yes. Um, we talked about mulching a little bit already, so I kind of jumped the gun on that, but it's a good time to do that. Before you mulch too, um, putting down a compost is great. You can use a compost like a mulch, but I like to do both. So I like to put a thin layer of compost down and then put my mulch on top of that. Uh, the Malapu compost is amazing. Uh, I feel like this makes everybody feel like they're a master gardener. It's really, really a beautiful compost. A, very thin amount is all you really need on that. And so that's that's when you mm -hmm. see the price of it, which is a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. But it's super, super concentrated. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like Sarah said, just a little thin layer. Mm -hmm. It is so, so com uh, concentrated yeah. that uh, don't let that intimidate you. Think of it as like a multivitamin. This is another good uh, one to use, the worm castings. Um, I love worm castings. I'm uh, nerdy enough as a gardener that I have my own vermiculture farm, which is basically a worm farm. Um, so I do all my composting with worms. But uh, the worm castings is what you get from the worms after they eat through all the organic material that you're feeding them. Um, and what's really great about worm castings is um, it adds a natural enzyme to the plant that makes it like resilient. It's almost like a natural systemic, basically. Um, so it makes it more resilient to things like whitefly and mites and stuff like that as well. So it's a really aphids, any of the sap sucking bugs, they don't like the taste of it. So uh, it's a really great one. There is some worm castings in the Malibu compost, um, but it's a really great thing to throw down on the ground and, and give the plants that kind of natural defense that they need. So it's a really great one. Um, Malibu also makes potting soil. So I love using the Malibu potting soil, especially with things that I'm eating, my strawberries, exactly. my blueberries. The, yeah, hundred percent. A lot of times we don't have organic uh, vegetable starts and things like mm -hmm. that. We do have organic seeds, but if you want to take a, a pepper or something like that and grow it organically, okay, it's not going to start but you can put it in the Malibu compost yep. and you can treat it as an organic mm -hmm. from that moment on. And it's just the best thing. And I, uh, it's, it's kind of expensive, yeah. but it's worth it for 100%. your vegetables, yeah. definitely, and mm -hmm. for anything that you just want to be yeah. tip top. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about veggies. Okay. Yeah. My favorite. I know, mine too. <laughs> so, um, we have uh, a selection here of some really good herbs and stuff. This is a great time still to plant herbs. Um, you want to make sure with things like basil um, that if your basil starts to flower, you're pinching the flowers off um, of every kind of basil with the exception of the African blue basil. Uh, that one you can let flower. That's a great one for bringing pollinators in too. So mm -hmm. basil is delicious mm -hmm. and every thing on the planet finds basil delicious. True. <laughs> every insect in your mm -hmm. garden. So basil will get little worms. So mm -hmm. as you plant your basil, 
Just give it a quick spritz with the BT, mm -hmm. and then do it every like three weeks, yeah. and you should be a little green worm free. Yeah. Um, basil, people call it all the time, what's eating my basil? Anything. I mean, yeah. if I was in your garden, I would be eating your basil mm -hmm. too. So That's very basil true. Basil is delicious. Yeah, um, mint too. Um, mint is great in containers, not in the ground, unless you don't want anything other than mint, because that's all you'll have eventually. Uh, it's really, really aggressive. Um, I have a mint container, and I'm always kind of a throwing a new one in there and kind of letting them duke it out. Uh, so at this point, I have no idea what variety is in there. There's probably about five different ones growing in there. Uh, this is the mint mojito. It's nice and big. It smells fantastic. Um, everybody always asks me, what's the best mint? And I say, just smell it and decide because I think everybody has a different idea of what they like. Um, what's your favorite cocktail? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but with this one, uh, it's really a nice big leaf to harvest. It's very, very, I love it. It's very sweet. Um, I love the um, strawberry one as well, but I tend to it's a little weaker in my pot, the the big leafed yeah. one, which I'm pretty sure is either Moroccan or the mojito has yeah. pretty much taken over. And, and having just a peppermint and a mm -hmm. spearmint, if you have mm -hmm. just some little pots that you want to throw something into, throw herbs, throw mint yeah. especially. Yeah. But um, it's it's so, I find I use more mint than I ever thought I would. Yeah, I do too. I And I, I used to, you know, turn away mm -hmm. a recipe, oh man, I don't have that. Yeah, but when no. you have mint, it's yeah. We're using it all the time. Yeah, and um, I find with my mint that I'll get um, things, uh, I, I really battle a lot of um, red mite and stuff in yeah. my garden. Um, so when it starts to look really bad, I just cut it way down and it just flushes back out again. It's one of those ones that's so aggressive, it'll just flush out really uh, very quickly. But yeah, I use mine almost daily. We were talking yeah. about this. I like to muddle it up into the ginger ale with lime. And that's it. It's so beautiful. So uh, during the summer months, it's really, really nice. Glass of water. Yeah, you it's know, fantastic. They're so nice to bully salad, yeah. with mint. We have a good selection of different thymes and stuff right now as well. Um, tarragon. My tarragon's doing beautifully in my garden right now. It's like the star of my herb section at the moment. Tarragon's hard to find in the stores, so it's great to have in the garden. Um, it's one that I didn't think I would like because it's a little bit anisey and I'm not a, typically a black licorice person, but I love this so I much. Like yeah, I, I love it so much. Um, so now I've got a couple of tarragon plants like tucked around in my garden, but it, mine is really, really pretty at the moment. It likes to be watered. Uh, it also likes to be a little bit sheltered. So if you have it in a really, really bright, sunny area, it'll be okay, but make sure you keep it watered because it's a little bit of one of those drama queens if it doesn't get the water that it needs. So a little bit of shading will help. Uh, you won't have to water as often. And, well, one of the things we always tell people is if you're going to have a little planter with herbs, Put like with like. So mm -hmm. you want your basil, your uh, cilantro, mm -hmm. tarragon, even uh, the more tender herbs. Yep. Put those together and mm -hmm. then put the more drought tolerant ones like rosemary and thyme mm -hmm. and oregano. Mm -hmm. Those can go in another pot and then you can water them yeah. um, for their drought tolerant mix. Absolutely. Um, also, it's still okay time to put peppers in the ground. Um, we're kind of in that funny transition period where if you didn't get your stuff in the ground in springtime for summer, you can still kind of tuck in. So if you find you have an area that's really empty and not utilized, you can still add things in. Um, think smaller um, fruit though. So with your peppers, smaller pepper types are going to do better and produce more right now instead of like big giant bell peppers. And uh, you can get really established. They'll just yeah. keep producing yeah. for ages. Yeah, my, absolutely. My just yeah, I, I got a shishito. I love my shishitos. I got two shishitos and I have so many shishitos. It's just getting kind of out of control. And I, this one I just picked because it was so beautiful. This Thai dragon, so, so pretty. Um, and just loaded with tiny little peppers too right now. Yeah, if you like to cook a little mm -hmm. something and yeah. some peppers in there. And then we have our seeds. You want to go over seeds? Okay, let's do seeds. Yeah. This is, first of all, I just want to say, I, this is the only one we have back there, but I thought I'd never seen this before. This is so clever. You put your seeds inside this little plunger thing, and then you use it to distribute your seeds a little bit more slowly. I think it's pretty cool. And measure, too. The depth. Yes, yeah. you can measure. That's cool. So um, these are the little peat pots. We um, we don't have the round ones right now or the little expandable ones, but we will soon. These are so great to start your 
vegetables, your herbs, whatever. But we're going to talk a little bit about what actually does do well in these and what does not. So I'm going to jump. Yeah, you go. Okay. So at this time of year, it's really hot, and <laughs> there's not a lot you can really throw in and have a lot of success with, except for things that are going to take a longer time. So things like carrots, which is really funny. Sarah just recently talked me into trying carrots again because uh, I said, I hate carrots. They take too long. They're so frustrating. Carrots take forever, and you think, oh, look, it's done. And you pull it out, and like the top of it is this big, and the bottom is like this long. So, um, but I'm going to try carrots again. Um, carrots, growing carrots at home is really fun. I did it many, many years ago. My kids really enjoyed it when they were young. I'm just so um, we have these beautiful carrot varieties. Sarah has insisted that I try these really, really short ones because she says they'll, they'll be done quicker. But I noticed that it actually says the sa almost the same amount of days for all of these. So I think I'm going to try some carrots. But I've got to get like a nice bed and have, usually with carrots, having clean soil is good. But the most important thing about carrots is to thin them. Don't be sentimental about when you put out a little row of seeds, which you're going to do in the ground or in your planter or even in a pot. Mm -hmm. Oh. So um, that, no, you want the pea pot. Yeah, that so this, this is such a great thing if people don't have a lot of space or maybe you're already full and you want to drag home some more plants like we do. Um, set up a, a grow bag and mm -hmm. you can just throw in a bag of soil and you can, you can grow a lot of stuff in one of these. Mm -hmm. But if you have carrots, I would say just be careful and don't move the pot once you start growing things because carrots get a little jostled, they need kind of calmness. So, but you can put lettuce, you can put carrots in here, and these lettuce varieties that we have, and Sarah's favorite one that we have here is called Drunken Woman Lettuce. It's the description <laughs> is also great, but the name obviously is what caught my eye. Gorgeous bright green leaves with ruffled edges and deep bronze crisp texture and sweet taste. And the most important thing that's on here is slow to bolt. Yep. A lot of times people want to grow lettuce in their gardens in the summer, but summer is not a lettuce time because it will bolt. It will flower very, very quickly if it's too hot. If you want to grow lettuce year round, you need to find a nice little area that's warm, but not too sunny. So maybe a little morning sun and you can, you know, these places near your front door that might be a little bit not quite sunny enough for some other things. Lettuce is a great thing to put there. Um, you'll have beautiful little plants. You'll keep an eye on it because you're going to be walking back and forth. But lettuce can be super fun. We have Sweet Valentine, Bronze Arrow Lettuce, and Jericho. These are all from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. We have just a really nice variety of seeds back there. We have this. We have Kitazawa, which has a lot of um, kind of Asian, more Asian cooking kind of things, which are pretty cool. We have like, what do they call it? The one cucumber that's... Oh, I forget. Anyway, we have but, a lot of yeah. really, really cool vegetables yeah. back here. What I liked about all the southern seed, most of them were lettuce varieties that are heat resistant. Yeah. So not all of them, For but the most part. of them yeah. were, yeah. And they're they're really fun. They're super easy to grow. And if they you are. like lettuce, I'm, I'm always telling people, Put a little row, just a little row, thin it out as it comes in. Two weeks later, put another row, mm -hmm. and two weeks after that, put another row. And then pick the leaves as you can, and it'll keep producing as long as it doesn't bolt. Try and just have a rhythm of planting things like this, and you know, maybe in a couple of weeks, you're going to yank everything and then just plant some more. But don't, don't plant the entire thing of seeds, because then you'll have just a bucket of lettuce. And yeah. I think we can all eat that. No, I give it a lot to my neighbors. Yeah. They're always like, here comes Sarah with all her lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way about my neighbors and our tomatoes. So, um, radishes. Sarah and I both yeah. love radishes. Um, Absolutely. Radishes are one of the quickest things you can grow. Maybe not everybody loves radishes, but maybe not everybody has grown their own radishes. They don't have to be bitter. If you pick them out of the ground and you eat them straight away, they are delicious. They and are. they're so much fun to throw into salads or have with your breakfast. I just, radishes are a favorite. And Great I for kids too, because it, it sprouts so fast that that instant, you know, seeds are not an instant gratification thing, but for kids, it's a fast one. And so. if you get them to like them. Yeah. 
So that's and that's the same thing with marigolds. Marigolds and radishes. If that's what you if you have kids and you want a garden, marigolds are one of the fastest plants to grow, mm -hmm. and radishes are one of the fastest yeah. vegetables you yeah. can grow. So we have these beautiful French breakfasts, and My we favorite. have the nemesis watermelon. Sarah and I are both going to try and grow watermelon radishes. We haven't had very good luck with them, so we're going to try. They're so pretty though. They're white on the outside and red on the inside, and I, I haven't had a great germination Ooh, success with radish. that. So we'll, we'll yeah, that out. but the French breakfast is my favorite. And then beets. I mean, beets seem to be kind of a very popular vegetable in general. Beets are super easy to grow. One of the easiest. And um, with this beautiful assortment, you can roast them. You can make beet juice. You can surprise all your friends with how delicious beets are. I can't understand people who don't like beets. They're sweet and they're really delicious. I know. And these ones. If you cut them open, they're striped inside. So, I mean, come on, that's amazing. It's like a magic trick. always been good, and now that people are roasting them and putting yeah. them in all sorts of crazy things, they're even better. They're having a heyday. They are. I think. And they should. <laughs> so, um, the one true kind of like, I have a vegetable garden kind of thing that we would say that you could try now still are bush beans. Not runner beans that might take too much time for them to grow and to set fruit and to dry and everything, but bush beans, these little French fillets, those are my personal favorites. Sarah likes them as well. Mm -hmm. And these little golden uh, wax beans. I mean, when was the last time you saw wax beans? They're so good in the salad. Yeah. So these will, um, you know, they'll grow and become a nice little bush and you can pick them off. And the more beans you pick off the bush, the more beans it will produce. Yes. So um, bean plants are, are really funny how quickly like you'll blink and suddenly you'll look over and the whole plant is just like yeah. swimming in beans and so super super good again a thing like this you could probably have a couple of beans you could have some lettuce you could have some carrots and um maybe some herbs on the side or some strawberries strawberries side, of course <laughs> um that would be really really good and so yeah. you could, but you can start everything in these little jiffy strips if you like if you feel more comfortable watching them, but beets and radishes and carrots, just throw them in the ground. Mm -hmm. They'll be happy as a clam. Yeah. Do you want to, I want to talk about our favorite things. You pulled some cute things over there and then you pulled oh. my favorite thing. Yeah. So this, this is uh, off the gardening topic a little bit of plants, but um, I'm obsessed with these gloves. They come in a bunch of different colors. This is just like my current new obsession. I always have something that I'm newly obsessed with. These are the best gardening gloves. I love these to death. They are not waterproof. However, they're textured. Um, but I tend to not be a glove wearer because the waterproof ones are so thick. I can't feel what I'm doing. And then I eventually take them off and I put them down somewhere and think I'll remember. And then I've lost them. Uh, that happens to me all the time. So I've gotten to the point where I just don't even wear gloves anymore and I um, have lost, I don't know, hundreds of dollars worth of gloves now. Okay, I, I never liked those and then you talked me into them and I do <laughs> like them. I like them for light gardening. I have to yes. be honest. I do have some other gloves that are, they're not waterproof but they're a little bit tougher yeah. and, and then I have I have a yeah, I have rose gloves and these ones. So basically, I have heavy duty ones and then I have my thin ones. But if I put so these on, you can touch I'll wear them for the whole duration of gardening. So I save my manicure, which is great. Uh, and I'm not spending money on that, but I'm totally obsessed with these gloves. Uh, they're a little bit thinner. I wear them at work all the time now too because I finally found something I can wear and not feel like I have to rip them off because they're too claustrophobic and strange feeling on my hands. Uh, they come in uh, a green color as well. Um, and yeah, a flesh color, but I, I absolutely adore these gloves. Um, they dry very quickly when they get um, wet as well. And then I have two pairs. So I always have two pairs, my wet ones, I take them off, I throw them, yeah, I wash them in my, in my wash. So they're always in there. And so I always have two pairs that I'm rotating while I'm gardening, but I absolutely adore these gloves and I've become completely obsessed. These ones are too small for my hands mediums <laughs> i'm a large but uh yeah i love these they're super super great and then these i'm so glad little, she brought these these are little watering cans we had these before we sold out like this yeah so quick they're just adorable you can make a little bit with them yeah this and some seeds and and maybe a grow bag would be an adorable mm -hmm. plant um one thing um 
two, two yes. shout outs. Um, I sold some of these gloves over the phone to a really nice lady who was giving them to someone because she was as obsessed with these as Sarah is. And she said, <laughs> I can't get to Rogers. I live out in the valley. I need to send these to my friend. And so I just thought that was really sweet and a really telling way of saying mm -hmm. these, these gloves are amazing. Also, we had a guest in recently who wanted these glass um, misters and we didn't have them. We just got them in this week. And these little labels are so cute. Because we have all kinds of labels, but this is just adorable. Seriously. Yeah. And so they're just the little, like, wooden labels. Um, this is like a little golf pencil. Yeah. How cute are these? I That's love this. Really, it's part of a very sweet little gift. Together. Absolutely. And um, we have... Everybody we, should have this. I know. This is like, I love this so much. This is... Twine. Yeah. It's just twine. It'll it'll do everything for yep. you. Just have a can of this, and mm -hmm. you'll be sad when it runs out because mm -hmm. you can't see that it's running out. But uh, twine to tie up plants. It's strong enough to um, to really hold a good branch, mm -hmm. but it's also you can kind of break it if you pull right. hard enough. So and it, it's it's really really nice. Uh, you can also use green tape or wire or something like that. But this is such a great thing to have right. around. It's the thing with the twist tie stuff is that it's kind of sharp on the end, and I've broken so many tomato branches with that because it cuts right into it. Yeah, and this is so the nice. Green tape is so hard to like yeah. wrangle while you're. This is doing just so. It. It's funny over time of using different things. I've become totally obsessed with this too. Yes. It, great minds think is. alike. <laughs> 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 I do like that. Very, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, is there any questions? Do you guys have any kind of questions or anything that you want to talk about? Any topics that you would love to hear for future things, especially for our live streams? Does anybody watch? Oh, yeah. We've got one. 